putting in pressure. All right. Welcome, everyone. We'll get started in just a moment. Let everybody have some time to come on in. All right. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, uh, welcome to Preservation North Carolina Shelter Series. I'm Julianne Patterson, and I'm Preservation North Carolina's Outreach Manager. Um, and the Shelter Series is free virtual programming that we started during the pandemic to connect with preservationists across the state on a variety of topics. I was just asked before this presentation why the name Shelter Series, um, and it's really because it's tied to uh, back at the start of the pandemic when we were sheltering in place. Um, but now that we're kind of getting out of the pandemic, maybe we need another name. So if you have suggestions for how to rebrand this, definitely let me know. Um, so because this is a webinar, we can't see or hear you, but the benefit of being live is that we know you're there and we can still interact with you through questions at the end. So please go ahead and ask questions at any time during the presentation. Uh, just put them in the Q&A box at the, bottom, um, at the bottom of the Zoom window and I'll moderate all questions at the end of the presentation. Um, if at any time you're having technical issues, please let me know that as well. Uh, you can use the chat box and I'll do my best to help out. So our shelter series have always been free and we hope to keep it that way, but I do want to extend a huge message of gratitude to those of you that added a donation to your registration today. Your support, either through registration or membership with Preservation North Carolina, helps us accomplish all of the educational programming and preservation work we do around the state. Today's presentation was a suggestion from our former Western Regional Director, Ted Alexander, who's a resident of Shelby. For those who don't know, Ted retired earlier this year from Preservation North Carolina after 18 years uh, with PNC. We'll be celebrating him early or later this summer with an event at Ingleside, June 4th. So stay tuned for that invitation or check out our website later this month for details. I figured we'd have a pretty big Shelby crowd today. So I wanted to make sure that um, I put that into today's uh, presentation. So Ted gave me the book, uh, Tales and Tombstones of Sunset Cemetery, Tracing Lives and Memorial Customs in a Southern Graveyard. And he especially noted how different it was from other books about historic cemeteries. So more than just a guidebook or a history book, it weaves compelling stories of the cemetery's permanent residents <laughs> with historic context on burial customs. If you don't already own the book, you'll definitely wanna get it after today's presentation. Um, it's available for purchase online as well as in local bookstores, and I'll drop a link to, to purchase the book on Amazon in the chat as soon as I introduce our, present, our presenters and get started. So our first presenter today is uh, June Haddon Hobbs, who's a professor of English and director of undergraduate research at Garner Webb University in Boiling Springs, North Carolina. She's the former editor of Markers, the International Journal of the Association for Gravestone Studies. In 2017, she received the Harriet Maryfield Forbes Award for Outstanding Contributions to the Field of Gravestone Studies, the highest honor a gravestone scholar can receive. Joe DePriest has a 50-year newspaper career, including work as a reporter for the Shelby Star, the Charlotte Observer, and other local newspapers. His North Carolina Newspaper Association awards include one for an account of his 1994 return to Vietnam, where he served a tour of duty as an army journalist. And uh, not probably not joining us today, but also involved in, with the book, uh, is Hal Bryant, who's a native of Greenville, South Carolina, and has lived in Cleveland County since 1974. He has a, B, a BA uh, from Garner Webb University and an MA in studio art from the University of South Carolina. He taught art and photography at Cleveland Community College until 2015. And with that, I will hand it over to our presenters. Okay, thank you, Julianne. We're going to begin with a beautiful aerial shot of Sunset Cemetery that Hal Bryant took. This is one of his gorgeous drone shots. And I'll let Joe begin with a brief history of the cemetery. Cleveland County was formed in 1841 by act of the state legislature. A wealthy um, farmer by the name of James Love donated the majority of land to the county seat, Shelby, 
and another wealthy landowner, uh, William Forbes, donated 40 acres, and that's where Sunset Cemetery is located. There's an 1850 map of Shelby, and at the left-hand corner is are the word is the word graveyard. So it was a Shelby graveyard in 1850, and later. It, came known as Shelby Cemetery, and sometime around the turn of the century, it was named Sunset Cemetery. And, uh, and the many strolls around Sunset that June and I have taken, the earliest tombstones we have found date from the mid 1840s. Uh, but there are many that are, are broken or so worn that you can't tell uh, when they went up. You're looking here at the old part of the of Sunset Cemetery. There is a newer part down the hill. It's actually a very large cemetery. You'd be surprised. When I look at this, I see something different from what Joe sees as a historian. I'm looking at this as an example of a movement among cemeteries that began in 1831 in Cambridge, Massachusetts with the founding of Mount Auburn Cemetery. Mount Auburn represented a new way of looking at cemeteries. It was deliberately located outside of the town of Boston. It was deliberately planted with beautiful trees and, and flowers, and people were encouraged to put up works of art or at least pleasant, uplifting sorts of monuments. It was supposed to be a place where people could go to renew themselves in the industrial age. It was very different in that way from earlier uh, burial places. Even the language that people use changed. This is the time when people stopped talking about graveyards and burial places and instead called them cemeteries. Cemetery is from the Greek for sleeping place. People started call, talking about the boxes in which they put bodies uh, and, and calling them caskets instead of coffins. Caskets are a place where you would put something precious. A coffin is, well, a repository for a dead body. That's about it. And when I look at this, the beautiful trees and also at the family plots, I see the kind of cemetery that was part of this movement as it spread across the United States. Although this part of the cemetery, in this part of the cemetery, you see pretty much right angles. There are also areas of this older part that have curving walkways. The idea is you're supposed to go there and, and be uh, renewed because you're going to get lost. You're going to leave the workaday world behind. I thought I would tell you quickly about how this project came together. Joe and I met when the Association for Gravestone Studies had its annual meeting at Gardner-Webb University in 2019. He was interested in coming to the conservation workshop, sent me some emails. One thing led to another, and we found out we were both interested in Sunset Cemetery. So eventually we began kind of walking around together, and he would tell me about the people buried there, and I would tell him about the tombstones. So one day he, he sent me a message and asked if I knew there was a witch buried in Sunset Cemetery. And I told him that, well, no, I didn't know that. And he said, yes, that there was a gravestone with a pentagram on it. You can see it here. And in fact, I learned later that the rather steep hill next to this is known as Witch Hill by cyclists. And there were signs of occult rituals candles and so forth. So I said, well, you know, I need to check this out. We met at the cemetery and I looked at this and I said, Joe, I really hate to burst your bubble, but that's an Eastern star symbol. It's not an occult symbol at all. But if you know Joe, you know he's like a dog with a bone when he is on the trail of a good story. He just couldn't let it go. One Saturday night, around 1889, way back in the North Carolina mountains, Cashiers Valley in Jackson County, a teenage boy by the name of Felix Eugene Alley was going to a dance. He was overwhelmed with excitement because he had a plan this evening. 
the girl he was in love with big time, her name was Kira Cole, and he thought she was the prettiest girl in the whole wide world, was going to be at the dance, as she had been many times, and he had danced with her, except that he wasn't the only young man infatuated with her, and people kept cutting in, including, of all people, his cousin Charlie Wright, so that he, um, his time with Kitter Cole had been reduced drastically. But this night, he was going to get there early, get Kitter, and he was not going to let anyone cut in on it. So he was very pleased with himself, and he went to the dance. He walked in early, and he guess what? He was bitterly disappointed because there was Charlie Wright dancing with Kitter Cole. And so a dejected Felix Alley went back home, he sat down with his banjo. He was a, a very talented banjo player, the claw hammer style, the old, old fashioned kind. He sat down and that evening, he wrote the Ballad of Kidder Cole, which recounted the events of the evening. Flash forward to 1929, the great minstrel of the Appalachian, Bascom Lamar Lunsford, recorded the Ballad of Kidder Cole, which had already gained a wide reputation in the mountains as a classic tune and it became a national uh, hit and uh, but unfortunately neither Felix or his cousin Charlie scored with um, Kitter Cole. She married a gentleman by the name of A.S. Nichols and went on to um, live in the Asheville with him in the Asheville area and Felix went on to um, become a lawyer and a very respected superior court judge in Waynesville. And um, in 1947, when Kidder died, her, her daughter, her only child, lived in Shelby. So she brought her mother back to Shelby and had her buried in Sunset Cemetery. Now, uh, if you visit Kidder on a clear day, if you visit her her tombstone, she's buried at such an angle that on a clear day you can see the South Mountains of Cleveland and Burke County. Now that's not Cashier's Valley where she was from, but for a mountain girl to be able to see mountains, still pretty good. And by an aside here is a young a young and new uh, string band, the Appalachian Roadshow, re-recorded the Battle of Kitter Cole last year, I believe it was, yeah. and you can look it up on YouTube. Oh, it's it's very cool. You'll want to listen to it. It's very, very catchy. Well, back to the fraternal symbols. In 1920, people were so obsessed with belonging to fraternal, sororial, uh, secret societies that you will find symbols of their societies all over the place. About half of the people in the United States belong to one of these in 1920. This Eastern star symbol is just one. This one is very stylized. It has representatives of five biblical women in it, and the star is supposed to represent the star of Bethlehem, so it's it's not an occult symbol at all. It, in many cases, has the letters F-A-T-A-L in the points of the stars. It stands for Fairest among thousands, altogether lovely, a phrase from the Song of Solomon. But it amuses me because it spells the word fatal. Uh, one pundit has said that perhaps that was a warning to people who might give away their secrets. Some of the other symbols that you will find, the most common one is the Masons, um, the square and compass with G in the middle for God and also geometry, which was uh, sacred to them, and, and Shriners is another one on the right. In the early days of the 20th century, the late 19th century, people were pretty isolated. They needed their groups. They needed people to band together with, and because this was before the days of, of uh, life insurance, they also relied on their uh, fraternal organizations to help bury them so people could put in a little bit every month and then there would be enough money to bury them when they died. Uh, one of those symbols is on 
or was on this tree stump monument. It is worn away now, but the story of Dr. Jonathan Chauncey Gidney is a good one. And then I'll tell you more about the symbol. But Dr. Gidney and his family occupy some prime real estate in Sunset Cemetery. They're up front in the oldest section and um, even the most casual stroller, even though they know nothing about uh, Dr. Gidney, will be taken by his tombstone, the, the tree stump. And they'll st usually stop and take a good look at some of the nice uh, flourishes on it. Uh, as I said, they may not know anything much about Gidney. He was a very prominent man in his day. He was uh, very active in the community and the Masons and the Woodmen of the World. Uh, he was super superintendent of health for Cleveland County. He was uh, city treasurer for Shelby. He ran a medical practice and he also ran a drugstore. And the drugstore sold the usual items you would expect. But one specialty item that uh, Dr. Gidney sold was uh, a patent, patent medicine line made by the Aker Company out of Buffalo, New York. And uh, almost every day in the local newspaper, Dr. Gidney would run a small ad saying, plugging some miracle tablet that, that he had in the, uh, the drugstore. This one ran in July of 1889, says happiness and contentment cannot go hand in hand if we look on the dark side of every little obstacle. Nothing will so darken life and make it a burden as dyspepsia. Acker's dyspepsia tablets will cure the worst form of dyspepsia, constipation, and indigestion and make life a happiness and pleasure. Sold at 25 cents and 50 cents by Dr. J.C. Gidney. Well, unfortunately, Ackers didn't make a tablet that could help the doctor's chronic heart problem. And in October 1889, he died. And he was buried in Sunset Cemetery where he has a tree stump to remind people who he was. Be sure to notice his foot stun, which looks like a little uh, tree stump. I, it, I didn't even see it until our wonderful photographer, Hal Bryant, made a, a picture of it, and then I was really impressed with it. Well, right in the um, middle of his stone right here, there was a an emblem for the woodmen of the world. You'll see one here on the left. It's worn away now because marble does not last long in, in uh, our humid conditions. This was an organization that was found by a guy named Joseph Cullen Root. He was a very interesting character, apparently had a hard time getting along with people. He tried to found this organization a couple of times before it finally took in 1900. And for several decades after that, Woodman of the World was an organization that that helped supply gravestones for its members, but it also promoted all kinds of civic virtues. He was all about what he thought of as the common man. In fact, he decreed that only people who were from small towns and rural areas could be part of this um, organization. He didn't want anything to do with those big city people. He wanted to give people like Dr. Gidney some attention. Now, Gidney, Gidney had some status in Shelby, but not on a larger scale. The uh, motto for Woodmen of the World is Doom Tache Klama, which means something like the silent he speaks. And this was a way that people who were just ordinary good, good folks uh, could get some recognition. Root publicized the uh, virtues of things like friendliness and honesty. He claimed that he got this idea when he was watching a sermon on some hardy pioneer who went down and cut down a tree to make a house for his family. A lot of these are on tree stump monuments, but tree stump monuments were popular at this time anyway. The one on the right is from Crown Hill Cemetery in Indianapolis. It's one of my favorites. And it shows not just the tree stump, but 
a male and female hand holding a chain that binds them together even after death. This is a very appropriate thing for a um, rural or garden cemetery. That's the name of the movement that I talked about earlier, which emphasized nature and death as a natural consequence. We're going to move on now to uh, one of the things that people had to face at this time, and that was the untimely death of children, particularly babies and young people. On the morning of April 25th, 1896, 18-year-old Stowe Lattimore woke up and hit the, probably hit the, the floor with a, <clears throat> a bounce and a spring because he was excited. He was leaving that morning with 15 of his friends, his teenage friends, on an all-day outing, a fishing, sending for fish at the first Broad River at a place called Sticey Shoal, named for the family that uh, the kind of grist mill there in Pioneer days. It was an idyllic place, uh, especially liked by the young people because of the idyllic setting. And and uh, so they all met on the court square in Shelby and they headed down down to Lafayette Street, about five miles to Stashi Shoal on the fir first Broad River. And Stowe was one of one of four boys that went into the uh, the water to sing for fish. Well, they got caught in a current, a circular current uh, near a rock suck hole. And one of the boys went under and Stowe went to his rescue. And he struggled and he found, but he finally got the boy free from the, the suck hole and, and pushed him on onto the um, land but unfortunately, it, then it got got stow, and his body was found about a mile downstream after that big surge. And they brought him back to Shelby, and there was a funeral at his home church, Shelby Baptist Church, and the eulogy, the principal eulogy, was given by a future congressman, E. Y. Webb, and um, he got a a pretty good eulogy, I may say. And among the many things that Webb said that um, just five years from the time he, he talked about Stowe, was buried in baptism to the time earth opened to receive him, it, it is beautiful and consoling, though to his mother and father, that they had such a lovely flower to bloom on earth and so soon to be transported to adorn the garden of paradise. Then they took Stowe a couple blocks west to Sunset Cemetery. And there he is today, the boy who went to on an outing with his friends, just a typical, ordinary 18-year-old boy, and he came home the same day a hero. So how do people cope with things like this? I mean, and by 1900, it was still the case that about half the deaths were of babies and young people. One thing that took a lot of young people off was tuberculosis. But babies, you know, most of the people, children who were born in the United States uh, didn't live long enough to reproduce. About a fourth of them died before they were three and about half before they became adolescents. So how did people cope. Well, one of them was reflected in that epitaph. If you look on the left here, this is the my favorite gravestone in the in the cemetery. This is the gravestone for little Georgie Clower, a five-year-old who died in 1878. Don't have much information about why she died, but her tombstone has on the bottom the most common of the epitaphs for children and and babies budded on earth to bloom in heaven. This was so popular, that idea that babies could be born on earth, but then they, they weren't just gone. They were gonna grow up in heaven and be taken care, care of there and be ready to meet their parents when they too were ready to join them. This became so popular that 
it was one of the two one of the epitaphs featured in the Sears catalogs tombstones and monuments catalog that came out in 1906 there was a, a similar one for Montgomery Ward you could buy a tombstone of about this size for maybe seventy dollars and the epitaph added about 70 cents for it this was a comforting idea you also see at the top of this a hand pointing up and the ribbon there says gone home children and particularly women were seen in this industrial age as cure agents who stayed in the home and sort of redeemed the awful realities of the world for men, their fathers and brothers and husbands and so forth, who went out to work. And so you often see hands like this, often with frilly cuffs on them pointing you to heaven or coming down to pull up flowers or uh, doing all sorts of other things. Hands, people in the 19th century were kind of obsessed with hands. They're all over the place probably as a result of the fact that people were beginning to feel more agency in their own religion. On the right is another tombstone for a little one. This is for a toddler, little Jane Webb, and hers has on the bottom one of the most popular hymns of this era, Safe in the Arms of Jesus by the great Fanny Crosby. This was her most popular hymn in her own time, and it was, it was a comforting idea that a baby who died, or a small child who died, never had the chance to sin. And that child would be held safe in the arms of Jesus and would remain pure forever. And this became one of the ways that uh, people comforted them. Jane Webb's tombstone, if you could see more of it, is actually a little cradle. These grave cradles became very popular as the idea of the cemetery as the place where people were resting or sleeping became more popular uh, in America. All right, some famous names. Well, a, a brief uh, resume of Oliver Max Gardner is on his, his gravestone. Governor of North Carolina, father of the Consolidated University of North Carolina, benefactor of Gardner Webb and um, under Secretary of Treasury, ambassador to Great Britain. Um, he was a high achiever from the very beginning. Now, Max uh, lived right across the street from the cemetery. And as a young youngster, he walked across the street sometimes when he wasn't busy to walk among the um, tombstones. And he was known to occasionally lie down on his back and gaze up at the, at the clouds. I like to think that he was uh, gazing into the future, wondering what, um, the life held in store for him. Well, he um, earned uh, the first, the only scholarship to what became North Carolina State University, and he was a hot A student, captain of the football team, star football player, manager of the baseball team. Um, you name it, Max was number one, and he. Uh, went on to, for a while he taught chemistry, then he got into, uh, he got a law degree and um, opened a law office and got into politics and the rest is history. When he left the governor's mansion, and by the way, when he was governor of North Carolina, Franklin Roosevelt was governor of New York, and they became friends. So uh, when Roosevelt was elected president, by that time, Gardner's law office was in Washington, D.C., and he had some of the biggest clients in the country. Uh, but he would go over to visit uh, the White House to visit uh, Roosevelt, mm -hmm. and he had Roosevelt's ear because uh, he knew that Gardner was not looking for an appointment or, you know, looking for something. So when Roosevelt died, Truman appointed um, Gardner ambassador to Great Britain. So he and his wife, Faye, Faye Webb Gardner, were in New York City at the St. Regis Hotel. And they were the next morning. They were going to board one of the last of the Atlantic Ocean liners, luxury liners, to go to go to England. Except that night, Gardner suffered a heart attack, and he did not voyage 
to England, he voyaged to Sunset Cemetery and at the place where he used to lie down on his back when he was a kid and look up at the sky, he lies now a permanent resident. These are flat ledger stones, so they're down on the ground. Uh, Hal told us he had to get up on a ladder to take these pictures. If you look at Faye Webb Gardner's stone, you see that there is a big difference here. When I take students to the cemetery, I use these two stones to teach what's called gender formation. How do you figure out what it means to be a man or what it means to be a woman? And you can see that on Governor Gardner's stone, it's got all these amazing accomplishments, but she is known by her relationships, wife of, daughter of, mother of, and that is common in all cemeteries at this time. Um, there's only one stone that I know of in the older part of the cemetery that has a woman's occupation listed, and that is she was a missionary for 43 years, but that is actually under the place where it says she was the wife of someone, and she was only his wife for seven years, so uh, it's clear what was what was most important. This is very interesting because Mrs. Gardner was a very accomplished woman. She ran family businesses. Um, she was a politician. She planned JFK's inaugural ball. William Friday, who was the president of the University of North Carolina at that time said, and I think her husband would have agreed that if she'd been born a few years later, she would have been a prime candidate for our first female president. But she wrote in her diary that being a wife and mother was the most wonderful calling a woman could have. And who are we to impose our 21st century ideals on her. Okay, we're going to uh, take a look at, at one of our local heroes, someone you might know, Don Gibson. Don Gibson was a poor boy from the South Shelby Mill Hill. He wandered around town as a kid. He told me, he was a friend of mine, he told me that he uh, stopped going to school in second grade and nobody seemed to care. He just wandered around town. Um, he had a, he was very shy, extremely shy, and he had a severe stutter, and that made it even worse. So there's little Don peeking into cafes, wishing he had enough money to go in there and eat. And at some point in his childhood, he, he discovered music. So that he listened all kinds of music. It didn't make any difference what kind. He listened to the Grand Ole Opry with his family on Saturday night. Uh, he listened to jazz, he, classical music. He told me that um, one of the pivotal points was after World War II, when the GIs had been in uh, station in, in Paris and came home, and they, a lot of them brought back 78 RPM records by a um, gypsy guitarist by the name of Django Reinhardt. And when uh, Little Don heard Django's guitar playing, that really uh, turned him on, and he was a lifelong fan. So he began playing in um, local bands. He started a band of his own uh, called the Sons of the Soul, and uh, they made a record, and they played uh, radio stations in Shelby and around, around the region. And, you know, he always dreamed of it. Now, he, he told me the music was the only thing he was ever good at. And so he dreamed of being on the Grand Ole Opry, but the, the stepping stone to the Opry was WNOX in Knoxville, Tennessee. So he took off. A friend helped him get a, a gig, an early morning, uh, a, a brief early morning show on, on WNOX. And to supplement his income, he would uh, play beer joints and um, honky tonks and try to make a few extra bucks. And he was always unlucky in love. And uh, he said one day, it was June the 7th, 1957. He's sitting in his uh, trailer, a trailer park in, in Knoxville, watching the repo man haul out his TV set and his uh, appliances. And, you know, his, his girlfriend's left him. He's had a bad day. And that's the day that he wrote two songs. One called Oh Lonesome Me and the other I Can't Stop Loving You. And they would, in time, 
elevate him into a major star. He became a, a premier songwriter and, and entertainer. Instead of the beer joints, he was playing the Opry and the Hollywood Bowl. However, uh, he told me, he, you know, he got into drugs and alcohol and uh, he told me that the 60s were just a blur to him. And so one day in uh, 1969, he was passing through Shelby, stopped to see his, his relatives and uh, a young woman that he had, he had known when she was a little girl in Shelby, her name Bobby Patterson. Uh, was there and they renewed their friendship and uh, quickly married. And she was elevated from a clerk in a local bank to the wife of a troubled country music star. And she had more stability than he had. So in short, she helped straighten him out. It was not easy, but he turned his life around and uh, they lived in Nashville, Tennessee. They lived on top of Big Hill where he could oversee Music City, USA. But when he died, there was never any question about where he was gonna be buried, Sunset Cemetery. And Bobby put up a, a nice uh, a nice monument that you'll be seeing a <laughs> picture of and uh, to pay tribute to her husband. And so the, the once shy, stuttering little boy who wandered around aimlessly around Shelby came home and his life was summed up by the, one of the song, song titles on his uh, tombstone, might be a legend in my time. Mrs. Gibson was uh, very gracious to let us interview her. She says that this very large monument represents her big love for her husband. She got the idea from it, from the a monument for William Brimage Bate, General. William Brimage Bate in um, Mount Olivet Cemetery in Nashville. He was a Confederate general and then uh, governor and so forth in, in Tennessee. And you can see there's a great deal of uh, similarity here. She had 26 and a half tons of green granite imported from India for uh, Don Gibson's monument. They had to sink post six feet down in the ground to support it. And you can see that it's a very classical looking monument. This is one of the characteristics of American cemeteries starting in the days following uh, the founding of the nation. We were faced with an interesting problem and that is that America was a brand new nation. We didn't have any history. So there was a lot of talk about what we should do to represent us. What was our art and our music and our literature? Thomas Jefferson said that what we should do is borrow from uh, the classical times from ancient Greece and Rome, and that is exactly what happened. So you're gonna have things like the Doric columns that are right here behind the Gardner graves and, and that were also represented on Don Gibson's monument, also lots of obelisks because that was something that uh, were part of classical um, memorials. In this very old stone, this may be the only oldest stone we've been able to identify, you'll see the common uh, urn and willow pattern, which was part of classical design. And over on the right, one that is ubiquitous in American culture. This is eggs and darts. Uh, the round part is the egg representing life and the uh, little sharp pointed thing in between is the arrow representing death. And so American cemeteries starting with uh, post-revolutionary times are full of these reminders of ancient Greek and Greece and Rome. When Horatio Greeno made a statue of George Washington, he picked up on this, he pictured him in a toga. The idea was that he was uh, a representative of all those values that were part of American values, a civic responsibility. We didn't want fluff, we wanted um, utility, strength, beauty, that sort of thing. And so you'll find this represented in the cemetery. Um, we're gonna look now at a, at a couple of 
interesting characters. We call this chapter Rebels and Revisionists, and we'll start with W.J. Cash. Wilbur Cash was born in Gaffney, South Carolina. His parents were uh, staunch Southern Baptist um, church goers. And uh, Wilbur was a little less enthusiastic about about that, uh, although he did go to Wake Forest and became a great uh, superior student. And he uh, was always interested in books and writing. So he was the editor of the Wake Forest uh, paper and he won a literary prize up there for a story he wrote in the magazine. And he graduates and he teaches school for a while and then knocks around from uh, newspapers to newspapers. He's writing on the side. He has a fondness for alcohol and tobacco. And uh, so in, in 1929, he submitted a manuscript to the American Mercury, very influential uh, uh, magazine in this country, edited by H.L. Macon. And uh, the name of the article was The Mind of the South. And Macon was um, impressed and he published the story. And uh, came to the attention of the uh, distinguished book publisher, Alfred A. L. Kampf, and he contacted uh, Cash and said, uh, could you turn, if you could turn this uh, article into a book, I would be interested in publishing it. Well, Wilbur was uh, very happy to say the least, so he goes to work. This is 1929. And he's working part-time in newspapers and uh, Charlotte News and has to work pretty hard. Then on weekends, um, he likes to listen to classical music and have a cocktail or two or three. And uh, so he doesn't get much done work on the weekends. Make a long story short, by 1936, he had written Knopf and said he had completed all but two chapters of the book. And so that was 36. So 39 rolls around and he hasn't turned in those two chapters yet. And Knopf tells him, we're going to publish this at the next, you know, in 1940, on our 40 list, whether you finished it or not, we're going to publish what you've given us. So Cash went to work, buckled down, and he did, did finish the book. In the meantime, on Christmas Day, 1940, this young woman he had met in Charlotte, Mary Norcroft, Norcroft they drove to York County, South Carolina, where they were married by a magistrate. So the uh, book is slated to be published in February 1941. He's married in December 1940. The book comes out, uh, gets a lot of attention, full page in the New York Times book review, uh, uh, mostly good reviews. And uh, on the basis of this, uh, Cash wins a $2,400 uh, Guggenheim Fellowship, and it's to, uh, he chooses to use that money for him and Mary to go to Mexico City, where he's, he's going to write a novel set in a North Carolina mill village. They get on the train, they head to, to Mexico, and they stop at Austin, Texas, where mm -hmm. Wilbur gives a commencement, commencement address at the University of Texas. Then they head on down to um, Mexico. Now, one thing I've omitted to tell you is during the 30s, during the rise of fascism in, in Germany and Italy, uh, Wilbur had been working as an editorial writer and book reviewer for the Charlotte News, and he really jumped on Hitler and Mussolini with his editorials and uh, said some very uh, strong, strong things against them. So when they got to Mexico City, he has this kernel of an idea that, wait a minute, uh, they may be Nazi spies down here, and they may have heard, you know, you've read about me, and I'm down here. So he and Mary were living in an apartment, and he started imagining he heard footsteps outside their apartment and voices, and he was being followed. And one day he began brandishing a knife. Uh, it, it was going to protect him. And uh, Mary talked him into going to a psychiatrist who suggested that they leave the apartment and move to a hotel, which they did. And they hadn't been there very long before Wilbur failed to come in and he didn't show up and Mary was uh, in a dither and she 
call the authorities in the, the big search. And I might add here that the, uh, something that didn't hurt her was that the U.S. ambassador to, to Mexico at that time was uh, uh, Josephus Daniels, the newspaper publisher from, from Raleigh. And uh, so they traced Wilbur to another hotel where he had checked in. And when they went to the room and entered, they found him hanging in the bathroom from his own necktie. And his body was flown back. He was cremated. They brought him back to Shelby. They had the funeral at the Shelby, First Baptist Church in Shelby. And then they took him out to Sunset Cemetery and buried the remains there. And he's there uh, anytime you want to go visit, as we do very often. And uh, usually I stand there and I ask, I said, uh, Wilbur, did the Nazis really do it? Or did you do it? W.J. Cash's stone was made by machines in the way that most stones are now. It uh, probably was sandblasted after they put what they wanted to put on it, his name and date, and a kind comment about it. At the bottom is a quotation from Alfred Lord Tennyson's um, In Memoriam, and also a brief quote from a hymn by James Russell Lowell, Lowell which his family had probably sung in church. It's called Once to Every Man and Nation. Uh, stones now can accommodate almost anything that a person might want to put on them, but it hasn't always been that way. There are many stones in the old part of Sunset and around Cleveland County in general that were hand carved. This one for F.A. Andrews and the Andrews family plot is the hand carved work of D.J. Hamrick. He was a man who came down on the Great Wagon Road from Pennsylvania. Um, and did all kinds of things. He ran a farm and a general store and so forth. And he was also the first stone carver and also the first mayor in Boiling Springs, North Carolina, about six miles down the road. You can see his name here carved on the back of this stone. And there are a number of these hand carved stones like this would cost you as much as a luxury car today. But in those days, that's the only way that you could carve stones. I think they are unusually beautiful. D.J. Hamrick's great granddaughter has told us that he was completely self-taught and yet his his uh, writing is very elegant and very beautiful. He probably brought in blanks, uh, uncarved stones from Georgia. Uh, this is a marble stone and and carved them. To today's audience, this looks like, well, you know, they're all kind of alike and so forth. So we want more innovation, but it might be time to reconsider the beauty of this hand carved stone, just as it might be time to reconsider some of the uh, controversial ideas of DJ Hamrick's grandson, W.J. Cash. The Durham family plot in Sunset, there's a stone with two bronze markers, one on both ends. And one is for Makaja Durham. It points out that he was a uh, states' rights man, a uh, leader of his people, uh, and that um, following his four sons, he joined the Confederate Army, uh, even though he was beyond the age of military service and that he was killed in action at the Battle of the Wilderness outside Fredericksburg in 1864 and is buried in a nameless grave up there. It points out he was a uh, reader of books, a lover of things of the spirit, and that in the year 1850 he rode by horseback all the way to New York City and then again by horseback to Charleston to hear Jenny Lynn, the Swedish Nightingale, sing. On the other end of that monument is his son, Plato Durham, soldier, lawyer, statesman. What it fails to say that he was also co-founder of the local KKK unit. 
the bottom of uh, Macaja Durham's, this is a cenotaph, there's no body there. So it's a cenotaph if it's a memorial with no body, uh, makes the startling claim that he took, it, it was about 669 miles to New York City. So this, this was kind of a big deal. This is an example of what is called a lost cause monument. He is lauded as a part of the Confederacy, but it, he is also praised for being someone who was about the finer things in life. So this kind of retells the story of the Civil War, not as a fight to maintain slavery in the South, but as a way to maintain a certain genteel um, way of living. When I first came here, many people told me that all Southerners were aristocrats, which is actually not true. And uh, it's one of the reasons people were not fond of W.J. Cash. He undermined that theory. But this, this uh, retells the story. There are around Sunset Cemetery, lots and lots of memorials to, com to Confederate soldiers. Many of them are marked with this uh, marker on the left, the Southern Cross of Honor. It has CSA and the battle flag on the front. On the back are the dates of the Civil War and the motto of the Confederacy, Deo Vindicie, which means something along the lines of with God as our defender. These monuments often laud the personal commitment and heroism of these soldiers and their families are, are justly proud of those attributes, but on a whole, many of these monuments are also about romanticizing the Civil War and the, the reasons for it. To sum it up, I have put pictures of three benches that are in Oakwood Cemetery in Raleigh. This was a cemetery founded specifically to take the bodies of Confederate soldiers. Some of them were, in fact, moved from Gettysburg there. And in a, a little open house of memory are all kinds of monuments and plaques. And three of the benches say this, "'Tis the cause that is glorious, not the fate of the cause." Ironically, these monuments are right next to an empty field with no markers at all. Joe will tell you how we found out about this. Well, I grew up in Shelby and, and around Sunset Cemetery all my life, and and I noticed that to the um, that the stretch to the the western part of the um, cemetery there was there were no no burials, no no monuments, and uh, I would I didn't think too much about it, but um, after I retired in 2016 and, and the idea of doing a book on Sunset Cemetery sort of floating around in my head, I was going out and wandering around the monuments and I arranged an interview with the superintendent, uh, William Lynch, who's since since retired and we were right there at that open field. And I said, William, um, why don't uh, people get buried in this, this open field? And he said, well, come out here and I'll show you. And he had me bend down and I saw the indentation. She said, because there are people already buried here. And he told me that in the, uh, African-American community, the word had always been that that had been a black burial ground at one time. Uh, we, this map was found among the archives of the Seymour County Historical Museum. It's an 1886 map made by Paul Kaiser, and you can see where the blue arrow is. This is the old part of, of Sunset. On the right is the cemetery as we know it, and on the left is a smaller rectangle marked colored cemetery up above it to the left is a uh, briefly noted colored baptist church so we know very little about what happened here except that it is a segregated cemetery this is what it looks like it looks like a big empty field in 1939 a man named anson melton came out here he was part of the historical record survey that was um, itself part of the works project administration he was given the task of of recording the burials up to 1916 in all of the cemeteries in cleveland county there are 279 of them when he got to this part of sunset he counted 30 indentations and he was so moved 
by it that he wrote a little poem in his notebook. And it goes something like this. It is enough to die, but oh, to be forgotten. No deeds to raise the dust when this fail, frail flesh is rotten. Oh God, may we die, but never be forgotten. I see this as an example of what the Romans called Domnatio Memoriae. If a Roman ruler wanted to get rid of a rival or of someone who, whose memory he did not wish to be um, preserved, he could call for that person's statues to be defaced, their names to be taken out of the records book, even words related to their names had to be taken out of the language, and they called it damnatio memoriae, which means damnation of memory. In a sense, this is what has happened to these citizens of Shelby with no markers. We do have four names from Anson Melton's records, but with four markers, with no markers, we have no way to honor their memory. You should know that there is a group in Shelby working now to uncover some of their stories and to erect a memorial to them. And with that, we will thank you and be glad to answer questions. Thank you so much. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, go if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the Q&A box and I will um, ask some of our presenters. Uh, but my first, the first question that I wanted to ask, June, you mentioned uh, your favorite monument in the cemetery, but Joe, do you have a favorite? No. No? <laughs> <laughs> well, that was an easy answer. Um, Okay, well, uh, the first question is from Christine Clark. Um, did I hear correctly that Plato Durham was the founder of the Ku Klux Klan? Co-founder. And that's the, that's the Cleveland County unit, Cleveland County KKK. Okay. And you said co-founder? Yeah, Leroy, Colonel Leroy McAfee was the... Uh... <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, how I, and you mentioned kind of how this whole project started, but how did you go about selecting the individual stories or the individual monuments to include in the book? Did it start with just reading a bunch of obituaries, walking around? Like, how did you how did you start? The publisher wanted to know that too, and we we tried to put that into words, but it it was kind of hard to do. It just started sort of organically. I had my favorites. George, uh, Joe had his favorites and we would just kind of walk around in the cemetery and get off the beaten path and we would run into one that we hadn't seen before and then start um, researching it. A lot of the stuff that I talk about is stuff I already knew from years of studying gravestones and tombstones and a lot of the stuff that Joe writes about he had written about um, or studied in the past and it it kind of came together in an, in an almost magical sort of way. Um, there was so much more that we could have talked about and, and didn't because there were so many interesting stories. Every burial there represents a human being, a rich, interesting life, and the way that people deal with death and their ideas about the afterlife and what life means and so forth. Endlessly fascinating people tell me sometimes they think I'm morbid, but I don't think we're morbid at all. No, because we're talking about, I mean, living peoples erect these, these are monuments to lives. Yeah, well, that's what I think was so kind of unique and what made it so interesting to read was that it was, it's kind of like a little microcosm of the culture and the society in this one town. Some people that left, but still came, like, came back and were buried in the cemetery. Um, but also everything in the book about memory and kind of how that's, as you just said, kind of uh, one of the themes of the book is just living, how living people choose to um, remember and memorialize those who have passed away and how, how that kind of evolves over time. Um, so really fascinating. Um, does anybody else have any questions for our presenters? I'm going to drop a link to order the book um, in the chat again for anybody that may have joined us a little later. Um, and we do, we just got a question from uh, Betty Stoddard, um, an incredible hour together, a visit to the other cemeteries. Uh, we've seen markers and stones. The stories are quite fascinating, of course. So thank you, Betty. 
Um, all right, well, if there's no other questions, um, I just wanna say thank you again to our presenters today and for everyone who joined us watching live or who's watching this virtually after the fact. Um, and then as I mentioned earlier in the, in the presentation, if you have a suggestion for a different name for these presentations, definitely let me know. Um, but also if you have a, a suggestion for a future topic, um, I'd like to know that as well. If you wanna be a presenter, if you um, have a suggestion for somebody who I should reach out to as a presenter, or if there's just a topic on North Carolina history, historic preservation, architecture, that you want to know more about, let me know and I can do the work to find out who would be the best person to talk about that. Um, a few people have started to send me some suggestions, so I love that and uh, appreciate that. So definitely reach out. My email is jpatterson at presnc.org, or you can just reply to your Eventbrite registration and that comes directly to me as well. Um, so unless uh, Joe and June have any final words, um, I'll just say thank you and hope everyone has a great night. Thank you. And we got a, another little note from Christine Clark saying, thank you. <laughs> so thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Have it a good night. It was a pleasure. <laughs>